strictly the economics of John Maynard Keynes, not necessarily about what some people following Keynes made out of his ideas. Um, and all the assertions, all the uh, statements that I make about Keynes, you can find the appropriate quotes in the article that I have heard you have received in your packages. Did you receive that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so whenever I say Keynes says this and Keynes affirms this and so forth, if you don't believe me, look in the article. The, the quotes are all in there to document that I'm not saying something about the guy that he didn't really say. Um, let me begin by saying that Keynes is, of course, the most famous and the most influential economist of the 20th century and up to, up to this day, especially now again in this financial crisis. I think that is entirely undeserved. It is a sheer disaster. Um, in my view, the greatest economist in the 20th century was Ludwig von Mises, infinitely superior intellectually over Keynes. The fact that Keynes became famous, the reason for that is Keynes said what politicians wanted to hear. Uh, and Mises said what politicians did not want to hear. And if you say things that politicians do not want to hear, do not like to hear, you are not likely to become a famous economist. If you say something that they do like to hear, you will be hailed as a great thinker. Uh, Keynes and Mises were contemporaries. Um, Mises was born in uh, 1881 and died in 1973. Uh, and Keynes was born, I think, in 1883 and died in, I believe, 1946. Um, they didn't know each other a bit. Uh, Keynes at one point reviewed one of uh, Ludwig von Mises' books, one of his earliest books, uh, it's called The Theory of Money and Credit, um, and uh, that was published in German in 1912. Uh, and Mises, and uh, uh, Keynes was uh, the editor of a famous uh, journal in England and reviewed this book by Ludwig von Mises uh, in this journal, and he said something like, this Mises seems to be a very learned man, um, but somehow um, nothing, nothing original uh, appears in that book. Later on, uh, shortly before his uh, death, or actually after his death, but based on interviews with Keynes, um, somebody wrote a biography of Keynes, I think Roy Herod, um, and uh, in the course of writing this biography, he also interviewed Keynes many times. And he asked Keynes, um, uh, Mr. Keynes, um, uh, how, how about your knowledge of foreign languages? And he said, I, I only speak English. How about German? Uh, and he said, oh, in German, I can only understand what I already know. <laughs> um, so you get somehow an idea of how arrogant a person has to be to review a book written in a language that he himself admitted he did not know. Um, that indicates roughly what is now to come. A very arrogant person was made tremendous errors, simple logical errors, of an unbelievable magnitude. Um, I want to break this down into several sections and begin um, with what Keynes said about employment. First, his, his, main, his main theses about employment are there can be even unemployment of labor in equilibrio. Um, now recall what equilibrium is. Equilibrium is a fantasy world in which uh, all 
factors of production are fully employed, everything is just repeated over and over again, nothing ever changes, no profits occur, no losses occur, and so forth. Now, equilibrium is defined as there is full employment of all usable factors. Of course, also full employment of labor. So, by definition, nobody before Keynes ever thought that in equilibrium there can be unemployment. In equilibrium, every factor of production, including labor, is fully employed. But that might be a minor point. His main point is there can be involuntary unemployment in a free market. Um, and he said nobody before him, the classical economist going before him, had ever discovered that there can be involuntary unemployment. I want to explain first what the classical economist thought about employment and unemployment and then show why Keynes view that there can be involuntary unemployment in a free market are false. Um, we have, when it comes to employment, we have for wages a demand curve for labor, just as we have a demand curve for everything else that is for oranges and apples and so forth. So is, we have a price for labor and we have a quantity uh, of labor services that can be offered. To explain briefly why the demand curve is downward sloping and, and to the right um, for these are prices, it's wage, wage rates here. Um, why that is the case should be perfectly clear. Um, if the price of labor is very high, then the quantity of labor demanded will be small. And if the price of labor is very low, the quantity of labor demanded is very high. That is very easy to understand why that is. Imagine somebody would come to your door and say, I'm looking for employment. And then you would say, what, what do you want in, in forms of payment? Um, and then he says, OK, I want $3,000 an hour. Uh, in that case, you would say, unfortunately, I really don't have any work for you to do. There's very little demand for somebody who asks for $3,000 an hour. But on the other hand, imagine somebody comes and says, okay, I work for five cents an hour. Uh, in that case, I would say, hey, of course, I employ you 24 hours a day. Uh, and not only that, do you have friends that also work for that wage rate, and I employ them, I employ them immediately also. Um, so just to make perfectly clear that wage rates have something to do with how much employment will be offered. Um, the second, so this is just elementary stuff that applies just to apples in the same way. If, if the price of an apple is whatever, one million dollars per apple, very few apples will be sold. And if the apple is selling for one, one cent per pound of apple, plenty of pounds of apples will be sold. Um, second, second thing we have to realize, there are limitations on what businessmen can offer in terms of wages. Um, and what businessmen can possibly offer in terms of wages is called marginal value product. Um, the marginal value product is what an additional worker would create in terms of additional revenue that the businessman could get by employing this person. Let's say if I employ you for one hour and you add $20 worth of stuff to what I sell, then it should be perfectly clear that no, actually, Wages are determined by what is called discounted marginal value product, but that is discounted by the rate of interest, but it is unimportant in the current connection. So if what you add in terms of value is $20, it should be perfectly clear that no businessman can possibly pay you more than $20 because that would mean he would make losses every hour that he employs that he employs. <laughs> should he pay you only 15 and 
there is a five dollar profit that you that you make. Then the businessman will be, uh, so to speak, enticed to to hire more more workers because he makes profit on you. If he hires more workers, that means wage rates will go up. On the one hand, the demand for labor increases, driving up the wage rate. On the other hand, the marginal value product, that this is the twenty the twenty dollars, is marginal physical product times price, that is, more of the stuff is being produced that is being produced and the supply of the goods increases, so marginal value product will fall, wage rates will rise until we get to a situation where the difference becomes smaller and smaller. He can never pay you 20, but he will pay you roughly 20. This only applies, of course, to businessmen who have to sell their goods in the market. It does not apply to government. In government, we do not even know what the marginal value product of people is, because their products are not sold in markets. What is, what is the additional value produced by your prime minister? <laughs> It's probably negative. <laughs> yeah. Um what is what is the marginal value product of a tax collector? Yeah, in that case it is definitely negative. What is the marginal value product of a teacher? We do not know. He's paid out of taxes. He doesn't produce anything that is sold in the market. We do not know what it is. So what I'm saying here this applies to a situation where we have profit loss businesses. Businesses that must make profits in order to stay in business and must avoid losses in order to stay uh, in order to stay in, uh, in business. So what did the classical economists say about employment and unemployment? They said in the free market there can be no such thing as involuntary unemployment. The only thing that needs to occur for all people to be employed is wage rates have to fall to, the, to a level sufficiently low until all people who are willing to work find work. Um, and there's no, no problem about it. Let me just emphasize also the idea of, of involuntary unemployment some logical problems with this. Look, if I say I want to have a million dollars paid to give this lecture, and then people don't invite me, um, am I then involuntarily unemployed because you folks refuse to not pay me a million dollars and I'm very disappointed that you didn't pay me a million dollars? The answer is, no, of course, and I'm voluntarily unemployed. Um, the same thing you could say if the price of Mercedes is too high and I can't afford a Mercedes, am I then involuntarily Mercedes-less? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a way, there's something wrong with this idea if you have employment, you need two parties who agree to it. And if both parties agree, you have employment. And if one party uh, does not agree, then this has nothing to do with involuntary unemployment. Um, involuntary unemployment, according to the classical economists, is only possible if you have a third party that prevents a pair of willing traders, so to speak, from striking a deal. Let's say we agree that I work for you for ten dollars an hour. You like this deal and I like the deal. You are the employer, I'm the employee. I'm willing to accept this and you are happy to employ me for ten dollars. If he then comes and says no, no, you cannot have a wage rate of ten dollars that you two agree it must be $15 that have to be paid. In that case, we can say this person has made it possible 
that we are both, that I am involuntarily unemployed because I would be employed and he is an involuntary, an involuntary uh, non-employer. That is, he would be employer, I would be his employee, but he prevents that we both agree to this deal. Now, this is then how classical economists think the only way that we can possibly have involuntary unemployment is we have this, let's say here, this is the uh, supply of labor, this is a demand, a demand for uh, labor, this would be the market, the market rate at which people could be all employed, and the government says, no, we impose a minimum wage. Let's say at $10, everybody would be employed, but they say, no, no, I outlaw employment uh, lower than $20 an hour. Again, recall, businessmen are not free to pay whatever they wish to pay. They are restricted by marginal value product. If a person does not produce something that is worth $20, but produces only something that is worth $10, I cannot pay $20. In this case, of course, at $20, the quantity of labor demanded would be far less than the quantity of labor offered in the market, and we would have this gap here, which would be standing for unemployment. So classical economists were very well aware of the fact that we can have involuntary unemployment. But involuntary unemployment is a result of the interference of a third party, the government, into the freedom of contract that exists between willing or not willing employees and willing or not willing uh, employers. Let me make it drastic. Look, we can unemploy the entire population if you want. All we have to do is just set the minimum wage law will be set at one million dollars an hour and it will be strictly enforced. Whoever does not adhere to it will be executed or something like this. In that case, of course, the entire population would be unemployed. You can have any amount of unemployment that you want. That depends on the difference between how high is the minimum wage set and how high would be the market rate for somebody. If the gap is tremendous, you have a tremendous amount of unemployment. If the gap is a teeny bit, you have a smaller amount of unemployment. Um, so how do we resolve the problem of unemployment? Have no minimum wage laws and let wages fall wherever they need to fall. And how can wages go up in general? I talked about that yesterday by having more capital goods around and having more capitalists who want to employ their capital goods and that increases the demand for labor services and raises, raises wage rates. Now how does, does Keynes propose to solve this problem of, um, of unemployment? Now Keynes realizes of course um, also that if you have unemployment, what is necessary is that uh, real wage rates do have to fall in order to get full employment. But the way he proposes to go about this, is, uh, how he wants to lower real wage rates to reach full employment is different from what classical economists saw. Classical economists saw to be in those areas in which there is unemployment, in those areas the wage rates have to fall until full employment is reached. Keynes' recipe is different. What we have to do, he says, is we have to simply cause inflation. That is, we create money, inject money into the market, and what is the result if we cause inflation, if prices go up? The result, the result will be, of course, that real wages will tend to fall. If all prices go up and my salary is given, then my real wage is, of course, lower than it was before. 
Now, um, you realize that this, however, only works. That is, printing up more money to cause inflation. If prices rise faster than wages rise. That is, if the labor unions, for instance, would realize what the government is up to. They create more money, money leads to more money leads to higher prices, real wage rates fall, and if the labor unions now insist, yeah, but we now we need an inflation addition to our wages. Does that then still work? That is, wages rise and prices rise, then of course real wage rates do not fall and unemployment remains in existence just as before. That is, his recipe only works is, a, is an illusion on the part of the working of the working class. That is, they do not realize they are stupid, so to speak. They are so stupid that they don't realize prices of all goods seem to be going up, but our wages are not going up. And still keep working, so to speak. As soon as they free themselves of this illusion and realize, hey, wages are falling, wages are falling, and insist wages have to be increased in accordance with the rising level of prices, then unemployment remains exactly the same as before. But unemployment then only goes down if real wages fall. But this is exactly what the classic economist also said. But you realize that the difference is this. Where the additional money is injected into the economy is not necessarily there where the unemployment resides. Is you have, let's say, unemployed people in the mining industry and unemployed people in, in the car industry. Then wage rates in the car industry and the mining industry have to fall in order to resolve this problem there. Um, but Keynes wants to inject money economy-wide, so to speak, uh, and this does not, uh, this leads to a redistribution of income among different classes of of the workers, it does not necessarily force those people who have to adjust, namely the workers in the car industry and the workers in the mining industry, to lower their wages. It might it might lead to a situation where other people in other industries are forced to lower their wages uh, instead of those that are actually the culprits of the problem. I'll give you an example, it's something like this. Um, let's say you come and sit uh, play piano and you see the piano bench and then you sit on the piano bench and you realize that uh, some of the height uh, between the piano and the, the bench on which you sit is not correctly adjusted. Uh, you always just uh, knock with your knees against the piano. So in that case you would have to lower the piano, the piano bench uh, in order to have the right uh, height between you and the piano. Uh, what Keynes, and this is what the classical economists would say you need to do. Uh, you adjust it to yourself, you lower the piano bench so that it fits your purposes. Wage rates have to be lowered for you. What Keynes does is, in that case, we simply have to lift the entire piano uh, and s adjust the situation in such a way. <laughs> you can do it that way, but it is a very unusual and not a very efficient way um, uh, to do it. Okay, this is this is his way to solve the unemployment, the unemployment, uh, unemployment problem. Inflate, uh, see to it that the level of prices goes up and real wage rates fall. But he does it in a very unusual way, rather than having fall in those sectors in which they have to fall, they might have to fall all the way, all around, and in sectors that are not even affected by unemployment in the first place. This, these are relatively minor, minor problems in the Keynesian, uh, in the Keynesian And what's, but 
to emphasize again, there's nothing, there's nothing new in, uh, in this idea um, about how unemployment has to be solved. Only his method is very, uh, very unusual. 